At the eastern end of Long Island, where the jaws of the North and South Forks gape, you'll see on the South Fork a creek bounded by barrier spits across the bay from Gardner's Island. We call it Akabonic Creek. Some call it Akabonic Harbor. We are the Akabonic Protection Committee, a group of citizens whose aim is to protect our creek and its watershed, its health and its beauty, for ourselves and for others, now and in the future. In our imagination, the salt marsh stands as the boundary land between solid ground and the watery world where mollusks, fishes, and grasses meet. It is a place of mosquitoes, herons, and hermit crabs, neither fully land nor fully water. We are at Laos Point on Akabonic Creek with marine biologists Pete and Judy Weiss. And uh, Judy, what are you doing exactly? Well, we uh, frequently in the summers go on what we call an Akabonic wade that would be open to the general public, adults, and kids. Uh, this would be the estuarine equivalent of a bird walk, except for birds, you use binoculars, and for these, you really can't do very well looking with binoculars into the water. So we go with our net, with the same net, um, walk around, collect whatever happens to be there, put them into an aquarium, and talk about them with the group of people. And then later, of course, return everything back to the water. around there is <clears throat> it's a hermit crab. See, it's a, it's a crab that is using an old snail shell for its home. <clears throat> These crabs have very soft um, abdomen in the back, and so they would be unprotected unless they kept their rear end stuck in a snail shell. So this is what they do. Uh, and as they grow, they have to find progressively bigger snail shells to live in. I mean, that's the most important thing in the life of a hermit crab is finding the right home, the right shell to live in. And it has to change as they grow. Let's see what else we have in here. So this little skinny thing, which is called a pipefish, is a baby. Pipefish uh, are related to seahorses. Uh, they're very odd shaped, certainly unusual looking fishes, very long and thin with a, with a little pointy snout at the front. Uh, the, one of the special things about this group of fishes is uh, that the female deposits her eggs into a pouch that the male has on his front. So the male essentially gets pregnant and the embryos are developing in his pouch. So it's interesting uh, reproductive behavior here. And yes, and he gives birth, uh, and uh, so there's a role reversal here. Uh, the 
Mr. Mom or whatever. <laughs> so that's what you're taking What else have we got here? We've got here. This is called a comb jelly. Comb jellies are uh, not the same as jellyfish. They don't have stinging cells. They're very transparent. They're actually very beautiful. And we can't see it very well in the tank here because it's transparent. Sometimes they're very abundant. And they are bioluminescent. They have, I think you can see in the photo, uh, eight rows uh, uh, making very beautiful design. And in some of these species, they will bioluminesce at night and glow along these eight rows. Uh, this is a kind of seaweed uh, called Codia. It's also not native. It came here in the late 50s, around the time that the, the Russians put up the Sputnik satellite. Huh. And so they called this Sputnik weed. And typically, they um, anchor themselves. They're being seaweeds or algae. They don't have any kind of root, but they do anchor themselves onto something hard. And in this case, it's anchored onto this shell, which is called a boat shell. And we see them by the huge amounts of this uh, washed up on the beach. On the outside of the, the seaweed, there's fuzz. This fuzz is not really part of this codium seaweed itself. It's individual, tiny, different species of algae that are attached onto the codium. So that's their sort of hitchhikers. Seaweeds are um, primitive photosynthetic organisms. They are algae, uh, which are the fairly primitive organisms. Algae includes seaweeds, which are big, and microscopic forms that are phytoplankton. And between the phytoplankton and the seaweeds uh, are responsible for most of the photosynthesis that goes on in the world's oceans. Okay, here's another seaweed, this one being native and very uh, generally associated with marshes. It's called a rockweed. It's a type of brown algae and you can see it has these air sacs or floats so that when it's in the water, as it is now, we've got the tide is maybe halfway up by now, it's floating uh, because of having these air sacs rather than sort of hanging down. But it's still anchored. It's anchored. It's attached to roots of the Spartina grass, or in some cases, it gets anchored to mussels that live in the bank here that we're going to look for. So here we go. This is rockweed, a, a brown algae, a native uh, seaweed, always uh, a, a, a common marsh species. And, okay, what else do we have here? We have uh, a couple of species of snails here. This, this is this is a larger version of a mud snail. They're very common in the shallow water. Mud snails snuffle around the bottom, eating mostly detritus, detritus being decomposed plant material. So they snuff up a lot of that. But mud snails are also attracted if there's something dead. Uh, you, I've done uh, with my students, you crush a mussel and the odor of the mussel, and you leave it in the water, and pretty soon you've got armies of mud snails slowly coming in to that mussel. So they obviously like animal food, too. Uh, there, there are two common species of snails near marshes. This one that stays in the water all the time, and the other species that I will look for that uh, is a periwinkle that comes on the, would be out in the air at low tide and sometimes climbing up the stems of the marsh plants. We've got two of them right here. Get in there. So, uh, are seen here uh, in the intertidal zone. These are snails that are living part of the time at, 
at, uh, above the tide line. As the tide's gone out, they're left high and dry in the marsh or sometimes actually climbing on the marsh plants. Um, so they're perhaps vulnerable to being dried out during low tide. These snails, unlike the mud snails, these snails have this hard structure uh, that they can, sort of like a trap door, that they can close, isolating them from the, uh, from the environment. So if it starts to get too dry, uh, if they're too high up and it's too dry, they'll just shut this thing up and not dry out. So that, that structure is called an opercula, and it's like a trap door. Now, as far as the other fish are concerned, uh, these big ones here are called striped killifish. Striped for obvious reasons. And uh, they are not the most, they're, they're, they were the ones that we got the most of today. Here's another one. You notice the stripes go differently on yeah, this one. Yeah, right. This one, the stripes are more horizontal. You're, you're holding the feet, the male, and I'm holding the female. So they have a different kind of stripe pattern. Is this yeah, as big as they get? Yeah, pretty much. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, this female that, that I'm holding. That one is about as big as they get. Someone once told me that in a Wainscott pond, they get to be seven, seven inches long. No kidding. They're almost big enough to eat. These are babies of the common killifish. Common killifish, also called a mummy chog. Here's a good view. They, they get considerably bigger than this. They, they don't get as big as the striped killifish. And they are, in general, much more abundant. And these fish uh, use the marsh much more than the striped killifish do. These fish will come, as the tide comes up, the fish will go up onto the marsh at high tide and feed on the little invertebrates and other things that are living in the sediment on the marsh surface. So they're up on the marsh twice a day at, at high tide. So they're very dependent on the marsh. They also lay their eggs high up on the marsh. They will lay sticky eggs that will stick down at the base of the Spartina plant and stay there for about two weeks uh, until they hatch. And they lay their eggs fairly high up on the marsh so that the eggs are out of water most of the time, but damp. Uh, but but um, nevertheless out of, out of the water for most of the time. And then when another really high tide comes in about two weeks, those eggs will hatch and the larval baby fish will be back in the water. Yeah, the oddest thing we ever came up with in a wade in Akabonic was uh, baby barracudas. This was totally unexpected. They were about four inches long. And we got two of them once. And never before and never again. And this washed up in the marsh. This is a, a dead horseshoe crab. So horseshoe crabs are extremely ancient organisms. They've been around since the time of trilobites, virtually unchanged. Uh, they look sort of fearsome with this long spiked tail, but they're totally harmless. Uh, there's nothing to be afraid of. The only thing, don't step on the sharp end of the tail. They're not deep water. They're, they're medium to shallow water. And they come and lay their eggs in, the, in May and June on beaches, on bay beaches. So uh, sometimes if you dig in the sand, you may come across their eggs. Uh, and what do they look like? They're, they're about less than a quarter inch in diameter and slightly green in color and they would be a whole clump of them. And these eggs are 
major, of major importance for migrating shorebirds, particularly red knots that are migrating from the south up north in the spring. And there's considerable concern that uh, people are overfishing these things. Now you might be curious, why would people be fishing for these things at all? Well, they are used as bait and um, if the populations of these horseshoe crabs are depleted because of overfishing, then the amount of eggs available for these migrating birds in the spring would be much less and um, the birds would not have enough to eat and so there's a lot of concern on the part of bird people like the Audubon Society about protecting the horseshoe crabs not only because we need horseshoe crabs around but because of the, uh, the essential role that their eggs play in uh, the, mig the, the northern migration of these shorebirds every spring. crab holes. You see up here? Oh yeah. yeah. It's too hard to dig in here though, it's a lot of crab. Right, we can't try to this dig is a lot more. Okay, fiddler crabs are, are very uh, important marsh organisms. There are um, two species that are pretty common in Akabonic. In the sandy area is the so-called sand fiddler crab. In the muddy area is the mud fiddler crab. They're the same genus but two different species. Uh, fiddler crabs are intertidal and they are called semi-terrestrial. They're active when the tide is out, which is a really unusual thing for a marine organism. You think an intertidal marine organism would be active in doing their thing when they were underwater. And then when the water went away, they would go and hide till the tide came back. Fiddler crabs do the opposite. They're active at low tide. They scurry around on the beaches, on the marshes. They're processing uh, the mud for their food. They're getting detritus and microscopic algae. Uh, they are fun to watch. You can, if you can sit there with binoculars and watch a bunch of them and the uh, males wave their big claw. Males have a big claw and a little claw. Females have two little claws. Uh, they're called fiddler crabs because of the male having this enlarged claw that somebody somewhere thought looked like a fiddle. And you can watch the males waving in a species-specific way their big claw um, to attract females for mating. Fiddler crabs then, as the tide comes back in, retire down in their burrows and spend the high tide inactive waiting for the next low tide to come out and do their thing. This is called salicornia or saltwort, and it's a succulent plant. Uh, put it in salad. Yeah, you can put it in salad, it's salty. You can take a piece off, you know, and, and taste. It's kind of salty. It won't poison you or anything. <laughs> and so this one is is beginning to turn red. We've got this one over here that's bright red or sort of purpley red already. Beautiful. Isn't it? They're beautiful. This is the uh, lavender here? This sea lavender, yes. Sea lavender. Uh, it hasn't got the flowers right now. I think it's past the past. time. It, has, it, it flowered Lavest. already. And then over here we've got... Elder and uh, the, these are higher up. These are, are hardly ever um, really underwater, but at the highest of high tides, the water may come up to them. So these sort of shrubby plants are high marsh species, and then really close to the water uh, that gets covered twice daily is the low marsh. So you've got a slight inclination, a, a slight hill uh, where you've got the high marsh here and then you can work your way down to the low marsh 
where you've got plants that are adapted to being covered by salt water about half the time. So that's quite a remarkable adaptation if you think about a normal grass that you might have in your yard. Uh, if you had it underwater, particularly under salt water, um, it wouldn't last very long. So these plants, and I'd like to show them if we could go sure. down there. Yeah. Um, that live at the very edge. We have cord grass that grows at the edge. This is uh, Spartina alterniflora. It's the, the low, lowest marsh plant, and it spends at least half of its life at least partly underwater. And um, this plant deals with the salt water by secreting salts. We can't see them, um, I doubt, today. But on a sunnier day, you can sometimes see little salt crystals on the underside of the leaves of this plant. So this is Spartina alterniflora, or cord grass in the very low marsh. And the, it, right at the edge of the water, it's taller than it is further back. You can see it's really tall here, and then it's shorter behind. And if we can find a ribbed here, mussel. Here's a quick patch. Here's a patch of the ribbed mussels here. And then when the waves don't wash over them, it's pretty correct about this. You see the ribs ribbing. Rib mussels are, are also important uh, in, inherent animal uh, living in salt marshes. Uh, they are unlike the blue mussel, which is sometimes uh, people eat. Uh, it's a different species, and they have these uh, ridges along their shell, which is why they're called rib mussel. They anchor themselves down with fine threads Maybe you can see some of them right here. They secrete these threads to attach themselves either to a rock or to other mussels or to anything hard. And these are fairly elastic threads. And if I pulled hard enough, I could separate them. Mm -hmm. But they're pretty tough. Mm -hmm. And so in cases of you know big waves and currents and hurricanes or whatever, they can stay and not get swept away. They're pretty solidly yeah. attached to whatever it is that they're attaching to. This plant Spartina patens is uh, behind the Spartina alterniflora on a marsh. So they're in an area where they are exposed to the air somewhat uh, more. So they're more terrestrial and less in the water by being higher in the marsh. The plant has a weak point, so it flops over and is found lying on the marsh surface rather than standing upright. Uh, and, and these fallen over things are called cowlicks, kind of like an uh, unruly haircut. Uh, the Spartina patens, commonly known as salt hay, was a major uh, industry in the East End and in many coastal areas for centuries, where it would be harvested. Uh, farmers would, would go out on the marsh when it was frozen, when you could go out with a horse and a track and pulling a truck and harvest the hay. Uh, and uh, so it was a, economically an extremely important industry. Uh, there's only very little of this industry left today. You can also make out a little bit the straight line creek over there. That's not a natural creek. That's a dug, was dug by people. It's a mosquito ditch. Uh, if you see straight line paths in a marsh, that's artificial. A natural marsh creek will be sort of wavy. And any straight line ditch is, is a mosquito ditch that got built. The point there was to uh, let the water drain out of the marsh faster so that mosquito breeding places would be out of the water more. Uh, it didn't work very well. Um, and people may recall in the middle 90s there was a 
major concern here in Akabonic that the levels of coliform bacteria in the harbor were elevated, which would be a typical thing in a much more developed place where, you know, you're getting human sewage into the water. And that's certainly not what one would expect in a place like this. And with further investigation, it was turned out that those coliforms were not from human waste, but from animal waste, like deer and raccoon. Mm -hmm. and, and it was these mosquito ditches were making a very quick conduit to get all those wastes into the water. And uh, at that time, the town, Larry Penny and, and people in the town built alternative um, things called open marsh water management that put out sandbags and such to keep the water on the marsh more at high tide so it didn't drain so much so that those killifish that we talked about before, the killifish could stay up there in these little pools and the killifish are very effective at eating mosquito larvae. So this uh, open marsh water management uh, is a much better idea than digging the mosquito ditches. Uh, that issue of the coliform bacteria uh, went away. So a simple um, ecologically sound solution <laughs> for a problem that nobody foresaw. Akabana Creek is a beautiful place that has long been uh, attractive to painters and photographers and people who live around here love this place. It is a beautiful place. Uh, there are some things we can do to help keep it beautiful, other things that some people do that damage it. Uh, we should try not to use uh, much fertilizers and pesticides on lawns because the runoff will bring these materials uh, into the marsh and into the harbor, and both fertilizers and pesticides can have very harmful effects in, to marsh organisms. Uh, another thing that uh, one finds that is causing damage to the harbor environment is uh, motorboats going too fast. Uh, when you have a large wake and large waves produced, this erodes away the edge of the marsh. We're so lucky to live near such a paradise as this, Akabonic Creek, so close to its ancient condition. It's worth a little vigilance and effort to keep it that way.